Thank you very much for coming. Uh, we're very pleased. My name is Bob Haynes. I'm the executive director of Green Mountain Economic Development Corporation. So um, the governor ha has his uh, capital for a day in Windsor County, and we were asked to suggest some venues, so this was tops on our list. Um, the Hanover Co-op is a wonderful organization. I've been familiar with it for 50 years in September. I will have been a customer and a member, and we're pleased to be here. Um, with no further ado, I want to introduce Alan Reitz, who is the Director of Public Policy and Governmental Affairs, who is acting as our host today, and we're very grateful to be here. Thank you. Well, thanks very much for uh, joining us. The Hanover Co-op is known to some as the Hanover Consumer Cooperative Society. On behalf of our general manager, Ed Fox, I want to welcome everyone to this morning's session. And also my thanks to Kyle Fisher of Listen Community Services for allowing us to use this space. Like the Hanover Co-op, Listen has New Hampshire roots and a lot of twin state impacts. So thank you, Kyle. With the Hanover Co-op acting as this morning's host, I have the opportunity to share a few Vermont facts. But first, I have an announcement to make. McLennan Corn is in at the co-op. <laughs> For locals, you know that when Alex McLennan's corn comes in fresh from the fields in Windsor, that's a big deal, and it is the taste of summer. He's one of our farmers around here, and we have a special responsibility to work closely with them, and I want to point out a very important fact about our cooperative. Uh, every February, we actually plan the summer harvest with our produce growers. It has brought stability to the agriculture sector around here, and it's a big deal for farmers, and it's a big deal for consumers. Um, you know, on display over there is a list of 2017 Vermont uh, producers and some New Hampshire ones as well. Hard to keep up with, but uh, I don't even think we have Larson Farm and Creamery, but they're providing the milk for the coffee this morning, as well as those Vermont baked goods and maple syrup, so I, I encourage everyone to enjoy some of those. We act to seek on issues of concern, and I want to touch on one with our cooperative, and it does relate to local and agriculture and Vermont. Um, among those paying close attention to the local food issues, there has been an erosion of local food and the meaning of its definition, and for us, it's a pretty big deal. Attached to the fact sheet that I've shared with the guests this morning and also on that sheet, you'll find an editorial, an op-ed that I submitted to the national publication called The Packer. Um, they had suggested the lightning or uh, more lax definition of local food. We need to stand up against that, and I have met with uh, Secretary Anson Tebbets on this issue, and we're very pleased that Vermont takes such a strong role in agriculture. Um, here are a few basics of the Hanover Co-op and its Vermont commitment, some of which may surprise you. Uh, founded in 1936, today our $75 million business is the second largest food co-op in the U.S behind Puget Consumer Cooperative out of Seattle, Washington. We've owned land on Route 5 in Norwich since 1973, and of course, that's been the home of the Norwich Farmers Market since 1977. In 2000, we opened our co-op kitchens. That's run by Joy Perel, who joins us this morning. 22 of her 23 employees are Vermont residents, and they prepare and don donate more than 1,200 meals here to listen every single year. In 2010, we deepened our Vermont commitment by opening a grocery store just a couple of blocks from here. It's when PNC went bankrupt. We stepped in, hired back essentially all the staff. Kathy Maloney joins us this morning. She has been the manager of that store ever since, and that deal was also brokered by Bob Haynes. In January of this year, we opened our second auto service center, this one in Norwich, hired six more employees. Jimmy Kidder's with us this morning. He and his team are going to have a voucher program that helps repair the cars of people in need. We're coordinating that with the Listen Center. And then just up in May, uh, this past May, we opened new administrative offices up in the Gilman Complex, up here in White River brought over 40 plus jobs to add to the Vermont payroll. That jumped our Vermont payroll by $3.1 million, bringing it up to $5.2 million. So in closing, let me emphasize this. There is no cooperative without community. This morning's gathering with residents, business leaders, represents the deep values we found in Windsor County. The people here are why the Hanover Co-op is bullish on Vermont. There's work to do, and we're ready and here for the long haul. Thank you, Governor Scott, for joining us this morning. The rest of the morning belongs to you and your team. I thank you. Mike?
Good morning. Uh, I'm going to be brief. Uh, my name is Mike Scherling. I have the honor of serving as the Secretary of the Agency of Commerce and Community Development. Very briefly, that's uh, economic development, tourism and marketing, and housing and community development. And for more information, you can go to our website or you can go to thinkvermont.com. <laughs> now that the infomercial is done, I'm going to moderate uh, a little bit, and the hope is to make this as interactive as possible. Uh, but to begin with introductions, I will defer to uh, Governor Scott to begin, and then uh, a minute from each of our panelists, and then we'll try to make this as interactive as possible. Governor? Why don't you do it from right here? Wherever you would uh, like, is sir. <laughs> <laughs> First of all, thank you so much uh, for having us here this morning. And uh, it's appropriate that it's here at the Listen Center uh, because we're from the government and we're here to listen and hopefully <laughs> help uh, in some respects. I, um, I've taught, we, we started off this morning in Chester, uh, and this is part of our Capital for a Day, uh, where we try and get out and listen to people throughout the, uh, the state. Um, it wasn't lost on me when I was Lieutenant Governor. I did this everyday jobs program uh, where I worked in the shoes of someone else 35 jobs throughout the state, everything from beekeeping to making violins to working in a, in a uh, <clears throat> hospital, uh, teaching second grade, all kinds of different activities. Uh, and what it did was it wasn't just about the businesses and what we do, but about the people. And uh, some of them were, were, and it made a lasting impression on me, working side by side with people working two, maybe three jobs just to make ends meet. Uh, and I said, we've got a problem on our hands. And uh, what I came to the conclusion was that we need more people here uh, in some respects. Because when you look at, <clears throat> we have 30,000 fewer kids in our schools right now than we did 20 years ago. Uh, the workforce is a challenge. 13 of our counties are struggling. Um, but we, uh, we can do better. And as long as we recognize what we have to do uh, and work together, uh, we, can, we can find uh, opportunities and ways for us to work together. So, uh, again, I want to thank you all for coming, uh, Representative White, uh, Becca White in particular, for turning out so many people. <clears throat> I know you, you worked hard at that. Uh, Senator Nicka is here as well, uh, Jim Harrison, uh, Charlie Kimball, uh, maybe others are here as well. But thank you all for coming. Um, <clears throat> we, uh, we are focused. Uh, like a laser on three uh, initiatives uh, to grow the economy, make Vermont more affordable, and protect the most vulnerable. And those are the things that, that guide us each and every day. And, uh, and I think economic development is something, and workforce development is something that, uh, uh, is something that uh, we really need to focus on. And we've done so. And uh, we worked with the legislature last year um, to do some things I think will help. But, uh, but it's an ongoing effort, and, uh, and I think communities have a lot to do with this. Investing in our downtowns uh, and the community centers are going to be important for us uh, to attract more people to the state. It's about bringing more families to the state. Uh, and that's, uh, again, what, uh, what drives us, uh, what are the guideposts of uh, this administration. And I look forward uh, to hearing from you as well as the other panelists about what we can do together uh, to make a better Vermont. So with that. Turn it over. Thank you, Governor. Uh, the, the, the primary goal is three uh, topic areas for today, uh, economic development, tax policy, and uh, Act 250, or um, permit process improvement. So our panelists are all uh, experts in that arena. So I guess we'll start with uh, Doug and do some introductions and a little bit of framing of the issues and what's going on. And then once we get done with that, we'll open it up for uh, that interactive discussion I was talking about. Thank you, Secretary Sherling. So I'm Doug Farnham. I'm the policy director and the economist for the Department of Taxes. So it's a, you know, it's a mouthful, but um, one of the important things is that I do have those dual hats where I'm not just looking at tax policy in a vacuum of, you know, what is good tax policy according to some extremely well-educated PhDs, but looking at the impacts of our tax policy and how potential changes are going to flow through and impact the economy, impact Vermonters. And um, I'm really excited about some recent tax reforms we made. I want to talk about those later, about land gains tax in particular and its impact on development. Um, but I mean, I've been with the department for um, just under eight years now. And uh, it's nice to see our tax honestly participating in a panel like this. It's nice to see everyone here, and it's good to have an opportunity 
to, to think of taxes as part of the discussion, even though it's not always a pleasant topic. Um, but I think it is a necessary consideration. Um, and it can mean, uh, you know, the nature of the tax structure can impact whether a business model is viable or not. Um, and the last thing I'd like to say before passing the torch is that um, coming to Southern Vermont, uh, a month or two ago I attended an economic summit in, um, I think it's Mount Snow, and as part of that I analyzed the commercial grand list of Southern Vermont, and we still have a lot of work to do. Um, the Southern Vermont really, the commercial side, really hasn't rebounded yet from um, the last, uh, the property driven recession that we had. So it's very important to keep our attention on that and and to pay attention to it and to take proactive steps to try to um, to rectify that. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I'm Brett Long. I'm Deputy Commissioner of the Department of Economic Development. Um, and we play a couple of roles. Um, first of all, we try to act as advocates for businesses. Obviously, they are an engine of the economy and uh, the place that we're looking to to help keep the workforce strong and keep people employed. Um, in addition, we work on recruitment, and that means both recruiting businesses that are interested in moving to Vermont or expanding in Vermont, but also more recently working with um, the recruitment of individuals. You may have heard of the remote worker program that's been in place since the beginning of the year in which uh, we're incenting people to locate to Vermont uh, particularly those people who are well educated and have remote worker uh, type employment with an out-of-state employer. Um, we're also gearing up for a new program where we'll offer si similar ki kinds of incentives uh, to workers who are interested in moving to Vermont to work for Vermont businesses. We also are very involved in workforce. As the governor mentioned, um, that's one of the principal issues facing the Vermont employers that we talk to every day. They can't find enough workers, they can't find enough skilled workers, uh, and it's a, very much a challenge. Um, we're involved with a couple of programs to try to help connect workers um, with, or I guess really connect workers with the triad of um, employers and educational uh, institutions to ensure that these uh, workers or students are actually getting the training that's needed by local businesses. We also work very closely with uh, Bob Haynes and the other economic development uh, leaders across the state. Um, they're really our feet on the street, letting us know what's going on, um, helping us to understand local issues. One of the roles that they help us to affect is we can see what happens in one region and uh, essentially cross-pollinate pollinate that to other regions around the state and try to make sure everybody's benefiting from the good work that each of them are doing. We also run a bunch of programs, everything from um, a brownfield cleanup fund um, that's been used here to also um, the local TIF program, for example, that Hartford has been able to use. And um, I'll let you in on a secret that from our standpoint, um, White River Junction is one of the huge success stories in Vermont. Um, the things that have happened here are, I can say that I live in Queechee. Um, <laughs> But the things that are happening in White River are the things that we're trying to get replicated around the state. Um, fundamentally, Chris will talk about this in more detail, but fundamentally it goes to what's oftentimes referred to as placemaking, trying to figure out what assets you have in your community and then leveraging those assets into um, an attractive economic environment. I'll let Chris take it from there. Good morning, my name is Chris Cochran. I'm the Director of Community Planning and Revitalization, and I work for the Department of Housing and Community Development. Um, we run several programs, um, working with our regional planning commissions to support regional and local planning efforts. Um, but a big focus of our job is the state designation program. So we are the primarily, the biggest cheerleader for our downtowns and village centers, and we work closely with municipalities all across the state on strategies and tools and funding um, to keep these centers strong and vital. Some are doing very well, some are not doing as well as we'd like them, and so today we're here to talk a little bit about um, um, a bill um, to make some changes to Act 250 um, to make it a little easier um, to develop within these centers. Thank you. Good morning. 
my name is Billy Coster. I'm the Director of Natural Resources Planning for the Vermont Agency of Natural Resources. Uh, our agency consists of three departments, the Department of Environmental Conservation, Forest, Parks and Recreation, and the Fish and Wildlife Department. Um, I personally am very involved in land use regulation and energy policy across the state. My office manages our participation in the Act 250 process. We represent the agency before the Public Utility Commission, and we help coordinate uh, the agency's environmental review across the Department of Environmental Conservation. Um, it's a priority for us. It's our mission to protect the state's environment, its air, its water, its wildlife, its habitat. Um, but we acknowledge that we need to do that and maintain a strong economy. Without a strong economy, we don't have the uh, flexibility and the ability to actually invest in the environment. Um, when we have to take care of ourselves, it's, it's much harder to take care of the environment and things that can't take care of themselves. Uh, so that, that's a priority for us, that balance. And um, I'm gonna talk in length a little bit later about the legislation that Chris referred to, but really the goal there is to take Act 250, which was a landmark piece of legislation 50 years ago, um, which established protections for the environment that did not exist at the state or federal level, that provided an opportunity for communities to get together uh, with their neighbors to discuss growth in their communities, and, and to take a hard look at that piece of legislation and, and bring it um, you know, in step with modern times, to make it more consistent, um, with our, ex our current state policies, our priorities, our goals, to help promote downtown development, to protect emerging envir environmental issues like climate change and forest fragmentation, and to acknowledge that significant work has been done in the state since uh, the 1970s when Act 50 was uh, first passed. We have um, much more robust local planning and land use regulations. We have state policies directed at downtown development, economic development, and there's a whole suite of state and federal environmental laws that did simply not exist when Act 250 was first passed. So there's a real opportunity today to leverage all that good work that's happened over the past half century, um, let that work do what it was intended to do, and help Act 250 focus on really on the unique services that it can provide Vermonters. And in doing so, make the Act 250 process more efficient to let um, developers, landowners rely on other state permits for the majority of that environmental review and to really make Act 250 a more nimble and modern um, tool for, for, for Vermonters. So I'm not exactly sure, Mike, when you want to kind of get into the details of that bill, but we're happy to talk about it with you all today. It's a great question. So, uh, you know, r recruiting people and housing them. Uh, Governor, you want to kick off the uh, answer for that one? Well, first of all, you know, there's no one single answer. Uh, we know that. Um, but uh, at the same time, we've been taking some steps, uh, trying some our state-to-state -state program, uh, where we ask people to, uh, to stay an extra couple of days if they come to visit Vermont, uh, to introduce them to the community, uh, trying to find opportunities for them, uh, a job, um, a, a career, uh, and in, uh, as well, uh, real estate uh, to, uh, to see if the community is the right fit for them. And we've been successful in doing so, attracting people to come and have, uh, have seen uh, where that's, uh, that's turned into families uh, living here. Um, we also uh, had the remote worker program uh, where uh, we took some criticism for that. Uh, it was a $10,000 incentive uh, for up to ten thousand uh, dollars incentive for someone to come to vermont move here and uh, and uh, if they could work remotely um, this has an incredible uh, high return on investment uh, and uh, we had over a million hits on social media uh, we had uh, we had over uh, three thousand inquiries on that uh, program alone uh, we didn't have dollars enough uh, to to uh, accommodate everyone. Uh, in the end, it was probably around 25 to 50 people. Uh, that was the amount of money that we had to spend on that. Uh, but what it proved to us was uh, that incentives work. And, uh, and so we uh, worked with the legislature uh, to adopt uh, another program that's similar. Uh, we hope to have uh, beneficial results from that. Uh, but it, none of it is enough. You know, we need to do more. And your, your point about housing is, is a good one, because when we, uh, we talk with uh, 
uh, particularly young families, young, young people, about staying in Vermont, uh, first thing they want is an opportunity, they want a job, a, a career. Um, well, we have jobs open at this point in time. We have more jobs than we have people in Vermont right now. In fact, uh, on our Labor Department's uh, job link, uh, there are 8,500 jobs listed. Uh, on a, we have the lowest unemployment rate in the country right now at 2.1%. Uh, so we have about 7,500 people on unemployment. We have 8,500 jobs listed. And that's not all the jobs that we have available in Vermont. So. Uh, the point is, uh, we have more jobs and we have people to fill them. So we need to, to get there. So two years ago with the, with the housing, for instance, uh, we, we all agreed we need more housing, uh, workforce housing in particular. Uh, so we passed a $37 million housing bond. Uh, that is leveraging another $65 million in private assets uh, to, uh, to make it the single largest investment in housing Vermont has ever seen. Now, it doesn't come quick enough. Uh, and, uh, and we're just starting to see the fruits of our labor uh, in that respect, but we need to do more. And we have another program where we want to uh, renovate and rehab uh, existing stock because we have a lot of uh, dilapidated stock throughout Vermont. Uh, but we need to create incenti incentives for people to, to fix that up to a standard that's, uh, that's worthwhile uh, as well uh, to make it affordable for people who are living here. So. Again, we don't have all the answers, but we're, we're willing to listen. If you have other ideas on what we could do, uh, we, uh, we, we would, we're all ears. One other comment related to that. The TIF program is an excellent The TIF program? Yeah. Yeah, we expanded that, and we had the support from the legislature in doing that. And uh, we would like to go a little bit further, but we've seen St. Albans is a, a great example of, uh, of, uh, of the positive effects of that in, in, this, uh, in this area as well. So. And when, we, when I came down a year ago for Capital for a Day, we toured some of the housing. Uh, you have a lot of housing, uh, and I know that some of it is across the border in terms of, uh, uh, of the need, uh, but, uh, but there's a lot of housing being built right here in this, uh, this community, which is good to see, but we need, obviously need more. Thank you. Uh, Billy, do you want to dovetail the little bit of the Act 250 modernization uh, outline into how that could help? Absolutely, and uh, Chris and I may bounce back and forth on this, but you know, th the core principle of, of the Act 250 revisions that the administration has worked on um, and that were uh, found in the bill that Representative Kimball sponsored this past session um, is really to encourage development in state designated growth centers. So, uh, state designated downtowns, uh, neighborhood development areas, growth centers, these are locations within the state where there's infrastructure, there's density. Um, and there's been planning at the local and regional level to say these are the places that we want to grow. These are the, the engines of economic development within the state. And the idea is to reduce uh, the role of Act 250 in regulating growth in those areas, largely because um, those municipalities have robust local bylaws. Other state environmental permits and regulations exist to, to regulate that growth. So the idea is that this would not be a free fire zone, but that these are areas that we have planned and focused growth to be. Let's make it easier. Let's in incentivize folks in those areas. And then that takes pressure off of poorly planned growth in some of the outer lying areas and the, and the exurbs and places where there may not be water and sewer and where the impacts of that development may be more significant. Um, Another goal with the legislation is to reduce the redundancy between Act 250 review and other state permits. Um, if you've developed in Vermont, you know that you likely need a wastewater permit, a stormwater permit, possibly a wetlands permit. There's a whole host of permits that our DEC issues for, for new growth and development in the state. They look at many of the same impacts that Act 250 reviews. That's because when Act 250 was created, none of those regulatory programs existed. They do today, they're very robust, they're staffed by career professionals and have very clear um, numeric uh, criteria for decision making. Um, we would like to make sure that if you have a permit from the DEC for something like stormwater or wetlands, you can use that permit in the Act 250 process as evidence of uh, compliance with the Act 250 criteria and you don't have to defend or relitigate that decision. If you have a state permit that says your impacts to stormwater are acceptable, um, you should be able to bank on that going into the Act 250 process. Um, so that's another tenant of, of the effort we're, we're trying to push forward. Um, another one is to really help promote economic development in parts of the, rural, the more rural parts of the state by supporting forest processing enterprises, outdoor recreation, 
and on-farm accessory businesses. Um, unlike our downtowns and village centers, there, there isn't often the density, the level of investment in the more rural parts of the state. So the idea here would be to support those really necessary and traditional enterprises in uh, rural industrial parks, uh, the diversification of farms, and especially with our outdoor recreation industry to really help um, trail projects and other sorts of outdoor infrastructure uh, be built and invested in in Vermont um, with, with the appropriate level of state oversight. Um, I think that Act 250 is, a, is an appropriate level of review for large commercial and residential projects. It's, it, it may not be the best fit for a recreational trail project. Certainly want to make sure that those are built without environmental impacts, but uh, the, the apparatus associated with 250 may be too, be too significant. Chris, I don't know if you want to add anything to that. The fact that A&R um, knows about all about downtown development, I have to say, is a beautiful thing. <laughs> Didn't happen overnight, but uh, thank you, Billy. Um, now, Mike, as you know, um, you know, we have our downtown tax credits that's helped you on a number of projects, but absolutely, you know, we would like to see more housing opportunities in and around our centers. Um, part of the effort that Billy talked about was, you know, a state level regulation, uh, but it's also local regulations too. I don't know if Lori, you know, I'm sure your regulations are perfect here in White River Junction, <laughs> and they do everything you want them to do, uh, but we also kicked off an effort to kind of, you know, I think all of our local regulations are well intended, but a lot of them are frankly like suburban zoning minded, and we have these large acre lots within our sewer service area that just don't make a lot of sense. These are areas that we've all said we want to invest in these areas, we want to see the growth happen here, but a lot of times our zoning doesn't support these outcomes that we want. So we're hoping by aligning this kind of Act 250 conversation, where do we want growth to happen? How can we get our local regulations to work with them? Um, I think we can begin to kind of crack this nut to get the development we want in the right locations, close to our jobs, close to where our entertainment is, and kind of get at some of the, the issues that you are talking about. Absolutely, our young people, the demographics that we're trying to attract, want to live in our downtowns and village centers. They don't always want a car, you know, so they need to live in these areas. Um, so. We hope to make some progress on that in the upcoming session. The other thing too, you know, it's not always about our downtowns and villages. You know, the rural areas do need investment. Um, and there's provisions in Representative Kimball's bill um, that makes it a little easier, rewards um, good planning, um, for, uh, industrial park planning with reduced fees. So we hope that we'll be able to make it across the finish line this upcoming session. Uh, maybe just take a sec there to add that um, it might not be obvious to everybody, but obviously in our role, we spend a lot of time talking to businesses that are either building a new facility or expanding a facility. And we do everything we can to encourage them to develop in downtowns. The problem is that it's often cheaper to develop in a greenfield situation. So um, what we try to do is to coordinate the various programs we have to, to help to level the playing field, I guess is what I'd call it. Um, but we, as I said earlier, we manage a brownfield cleanup fund. Oftentimes we, found, we find that brownfields are concentrated in downtown areas. This helps to make it less expensive to develop those areas. Um, in our agency, we also make available community development block grants, which can be used to help spur development. Um, we particularly like to focus where we're, we're hitting a lots of objectives at the same time. Um, and as we talked about earlier, um, if you're in a downtown area, you have the opportunity to create a TIF district and help with the infrastructure associated with doing that kind of development. So we're really focused, and as I say, White River is a great example, on situations where we can bring a whole bunch of assets to bear and um, make things happen. Great. No, just so just very quickly, adding to that. So um, lining up the incentives is great, and one of the things we looked at this session the under the governor's leadership, uh, we asked for a land gains repeal, um, and, and, and eventually came to a land gains reform. Now, land gains really quickly um, is a tax uh, designed to prevent real estate speculation, and it has an escalating tax rate depending on how much gain you realize and how quickly you do it. Um, so the reform, which is taking effect January 1st, is very meaningful in that it leaves um, it leaves in place that structure to prevent speculation if there's subdivision. So in looking at it, uh, we found you know we want to still continue to prevent subdivision, particularly outside of these designated areas where growth is occurring. So the downtown districts, the historic districts, the 
Um, all of these areas maintained by ACCD are uh, going to be exempted from land gains going forward so that that's one less barrier for people to deal with. And yes, land gains had an exemption for primary housing, but from all the demographics work I've done over the last couple of years, millennials and younger don't want to move in and buy a house. So that it's trending away from purchasing and owner occupation towards uh, more of a rental activity. And land gains was actually, uh, last year when we went on Capital for a Day in I think Orleans County, it was preventing a developer from moving forward on a project that had all of its other approvals. It just wasn't feasible because they were going to face land gains for developing the building and then selling it. Uh, and it was in an area inside town, it was smart development, and it was something that everyone wanted to happen, but the tax just needed to be updated. Uh, so I think that's important to speak to Billy's earlier comment about a balanced approach. I think we did get a win-win where we still have a structure preventing speculation and breaking up large parcels, um, but in specified areas, uh, we've removed a barrier to development where we want it to occur. Act 250 rule, if you, you can use uh, another state permit as um, evidence for compliance with Act 250 criteria. They're called rebuttable presumptions. So if you have a wetlands permit, you can use that as your evidence that you've met the wetlands criteria. Um, and through rule, the Natural Resources Board, who administers Act 250, our agency does not, we're just a participant in Act 250, the, the Natural Resources Board can dictate the sequencing of those things. They can say you can either you, you either have to wait to get your Act 250 permit until you've gotten all of your collateral A&R permits. Um, some commissions have said, as long as you've demonstrated significant progress towards obtaining those permits, we'll issue your Act 250. And other commissions have said, um, you know, we're going to give you your Act 250 permit, just go get your agency permits after the fact. So there hasn't been a great deal of consistency, as far as I know, across the districts. Um, but we have heard from the Natural Resources Board that that's an issue they do plan to address. And I know Greg Bubel from the, the Natural Resources Board is here, and he may be able to speak with you about it later. But, you know, I think our, our position is these things should be able to go um, at, a, at a, a reasonable pacing and sequencing so that nothing holds the other up. That if you're making good progress with an A&R permit, you should be able to proceed uh, appropriately through Act 250. The goal of this legislation is to really um, reduce that bind even further and just say, if you're going to get the state permit, then we don't really need to address this issue within the Act 250 process. It is, it is challenging. Water and wastewater systems, the money for it, you know, it used to be a federal grant and you didn't, you just, you know, got the money and you built the system. Um, to install them now, it's much more challenging than it's ever been, especially in our smaller communities where they just, uh, it's the financial capacity is a constraint, but also just the, the, the volunteers basically who have to come together and kind of get their head around a complex engineering project like that. And you go through a very extensive process only to find a price tag that's very expensive. So while there are a lot of loans given to bring projects to kind of pre-planning stages, often it's the price tag that scares people away. So we've taken a step back from that. We got a, we worked with A&R on a pilot program. It's in Burke and Walcott to kind of rethink how we do kind of small scale wastewater for these villages that want the density but just don't have the capacity. Um, so we've reimagined the process and we're hoping to, to learn a lot. I think we've learned a lot already from that. Um, but it is a, a point of financing, but it's also a point of local capacity. How can we uh, fill some of the gaps in the local capacity to design these systems? And, and also it's, a, you know, it's not always an engineering conversation. It's also kind of a community development conversation. How do you get people to think 20 years from now about where they want their town to be? I think people often think, oh, that system, you know, is, is not for me. I don't need to make that investment. But when you think about your property and your real estate and where you, when you want to sell it 20 years from now, and if you can't because you don't have adequate capacity, I think having these conversations in these communities, I think, is important. And we hope um, by next year, um, communities, these two communities will be well on their way, and we hope to expand the program to other parts of the state um, after that. And I'll just add, we're in preliminary... Um, very preliminary conversations, sort of exploratory conversations around alternative technologies um, rather than wastewater systems for certain kinds of units and accessory dwelling units. So adding housing stock without adding um, significant capacity uh, needs and using existing systems. And 
It's not to say that's a promise of specific progress, but we're starting to explore creativity. Governor, anything to add on? Uh, well, I do think we have to get creative, and uh, we have to look outside the, the box, so to speak, um, wondering about what are the communities within this area? What's the breaking point in terms of, uh, of, of folks traveling uh, to work? Uh, Dartmouth, I know, is a, is a uh, I think that's the epicenter in some respects to, uh, to employment. Uh, and so wh how far are people willing to travel? Uh, just came from Springfield, for instance. Is there more capacity in Springfield? Is there more capacity in Bradford? Is there more, you know, I think we have to start thinking about the surrounding region as a whole as to whether they have capacity in order to build uh, some of that housing that's desperately needed. Thank you. Connectivity certainly, I'll, and I'll take the first crack at that, uh, connectivity certainly uh, is something we hear about quite frequently. Um, Deputy Commissioner Long does say there is a hot nightlife in Queechy, so <laughs> I, th I, th I think you have it covered. Um, but we are beginning, if you go to thinkvermont.com, you'll start to see the emergence of uh, the, the kinds of threads that you're talking about, where we're presenting to people looking to relocate within Vermont or outside Vermont. Uh, to look at communities that do have the emerging uh, fiber optic technologies um, and, and other places that are ripe for that kind of construction. But uh, with that preliminary intro, I'll defer to the governor and then we'll see if others have something Well, first to add. of all, thank you for EC Fiber for doing your part. Uh, and I think that it is something that's growing throughout the, the state. I live in Berlin and uh, there's an effort there as well. So. Um, we, uh, it's not lost on me when you look at uh, the highest speed, highest capacity broadband in the state. Uh, you, you look at what those uh, communities are, uh, Brattleboro, Springfield, uh, Newport, Hancock, uh, a few areas like that. Not exactly thriving economic uh, uh, epicenters, but, um, I, I, and I, you're, I take your point well, because we should be talking about there is capacity here, and there is a, the ability uh, to do business here in certain areas where we have that high capacity uh, expanded broadband. So we, the state of stay weekends are something that I think we should be utilizing more and talking about that more. Uh, and, and if you have any ideas on how we can exploit that and, and leverage that, it's just like everything else that we do here. We do a lot of good things in Vermont, very proud of, of, uh, of, of the efforts of uh, the EC fibers, as well with some of the, we're becoming known as uh, the, the uh, mountain biking uh, center of, of the country. I mean, we're, we're leaps and bounds. We're doing a lot. In fact, I'm, we're going to Suicide Six this afternoon at the end of the day uh, to, to go on some of their trails. So we're getting known for that. And we need to leverage everything, our outdoor recreation, uh, the, the outstanding uh, uh, fiber uh, opportunities, some things that we do, the niche uh, markets, and we just have to find a way to do that. But it's very difficult to market. You, you know, we all realize that, and, and it's very expensive. I use myself as an example. Um, I've uh, lived in Vermont uh, my uh, entire life thus far, and I, um, I had a business here for three decades. I was uh, in, this, uh, in the Senate uh, for five terms. I was lieutenant governor for three terms and now governor. Um, I've been successful in race car driving uh, and I have some name recognition, but I can still go to areas of the state, within the state. And, and I spent millions of dollars running for, for governor <laughs> to, to, to market my name, right? I can go to areas of the state where people have never heard of me. <laughs> True. True, have no idea who I am. Uh, and so that just illustrates how difficult it is to market within the state. Now take that outside of the state and, uh, and take, you know, uh, Mike will talk a little bit about our, our marketing and the, the, our budget and the number of people involved in doing so. It's, it's hard, it's difficult. Uh, so if we have any ideas on how to do that, the state of state or the uh, remote worker program, again, we had all a million hits on it. That was all free, free advertising. Uh, so we need to find ways uh, to 
to leverage what we have. And, and I don't have all the answers, but Mike, do you want to add to that? Sure, I'll just add that uh, we were fortunate that the legislature doubled our economic development marketing uh, budget for this, this last session to $450,000, um, which is a significant uh, increase, uh, but that, as the governor indicated, it's a, it's a very small amount of money to, uh, to, to pitch to the rest of the country, uh, even in a targeted way when we've got the, um, the ability to uh, really identify people that have an interest in Vermont. It's still um, uh, it's a limited uh, investment to, to sell that message yeah, with, uh, with young professionals and others around economic development, and then uh, we can go from there. Um, it's actually quite uh, topical as the, one of the initiatives that have been undertaken during the governor's term has been the creation of a Think Vermont website. And the whole idea is to create a website that's attractive to millennials when you really boil it down. Um, it focuses on the things that we think we do well. It focuses on the safety of the communities. It focuses on the high education um, scores that the state gets. And it has a young vibe. And um, along those lines, um, just before she left, um, Commissioner Wendy Knight of the Department of Tourism was actually implementing a program to increase the diversity of what we publish. Um, specifically on that site, but in general. So um, not just millennials, but um, all kinds of diversity. If I could just add, you know, another front, and it's maybe less conspicuous, but I think the governor alluded to, we're really investing in the outdoor recreation economy, and um, that's not solely a, a young person's game, but it, it certainly is to some extent. So I think, you know, we're seeing a huge growth in the outdoor market. All, a bike. All, yeah. I'm, <laughs> I'm not a millennial anymore. Right. Um, so, you know, we're seeing huge growth in all those industries, four seasons, not only in actual facilities to go recreate, but businesses that to support them, uh, industry around creating equipment and gear to support those industries, tourism, um, a whole suite of, of, of endeavors that many young people are taking up. Similarly, we're supporting um, through our Department of Environmental Conservation, uh, the brewery industry. I believe we're, we'll likely launch some outreach to um, hemp and CBD growers. So these are new industries that aren't um, solely uh, the domain of younger folks, but it's certainly um, a good portion of that population. So we, we're hoping to kind of support the industries and infrastructure that younger people come to Vermont for and, and hopefully keep them here. With that, I'm going to hand it to the governor for closing remarks, and then uh, some of us can stay behind and uh, chat further when we're done. Well, again, I thank you uh, for coming today as well. Uh, keep feeding us any ideas you have, because you never know uh, what's going to work. And we're willing to try a lot of different things uh, in order to, to satisfy uh, this dilemma we find ourselves in. Uh, when you have more people, uh, we have more jobs available than we have people. Um, that's, uh, that's a good problem to have in some respects, uh, but it's frustrating uh, at, the, at the same time. So uh, we, uh, we're, uh, again, leveraging everything that we have. I'll just tell one quick story. I told it earlier uh, when we were in Chester, uh, but we did on uh, a capital for a day, we were up in the Northeast Kingdom, and there was another, I visited uh, UTC Aerospace in Virgins, uh, Collins Aerospace now, and they were, um, they're looking to expand. Uh, they have 150 employees, really is a gem uh, for us, high paying jobs, average wage uh, for an engineer there is 100 grand. Um, but they need engineers, they need uh, electrical, uh, uh, mechanical engineers, and, uh, and they need about 50 of them to expand. So they were talking about uh, their, uh, their efforts in doing so and weren't having a lot of success in finding these engineers. So we're hooking them up with uh, Norwich University and UVM and so forth and BTC who have uh, engineering programs. Uh, but th it was the following week and we were on capital for a day up in the Northeast Kingdom. We were at Eden Ciders and there was a company there. Uh, we were having a little bit of a round table discussion and there was a company there that was an engineering firm and I told this story about UTC and they said, uh, well, we don't have any problem uh, finding engineers. And, and I said, well, let us tell us how you accomplish that. What's the secret sauce? I want to share that with the uh, UTC Aerospace. And they said, 
Every time we need an engineer, uh, we put an ad in a mountain biking magazine and we get an instant hit. Uh, we never have a lack of uh, applicants. Uh, and that just goes, again, it's not the total answer, I, I get that, but it shows uh, that we have to use everything that we have, all the resources and, and opportunities we have uh, to, to attract more people, more families uh, into the state. Uh, and so uh, we're willing to do so. If you have ideas, send them to us, we'll listen. Uh, talk with your representatives, your legislators, um, because again, we're, we're all in this together. We wanna solve this. Uh, we just, uh, it's just frustrating to, to figure out how to do so. And so, but with your help, uh, I'm confident we can do this. Uh, we have too much to offer here in the state uh, to let it go uh, by the wayside. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you, Governor. Thank you all for coming out and we'll stick around for a little while.